All right. Well, so unfortunately, we're going to do a live stream, but uh, after the Zoom update, my channel patch doesn't work for my stupid Apple computer anymore. So we're just going to do this as a pre record. I'll upload it later. Um, I'll, I'll, uh, if you guys didn't hear the introduction, uh, this is Apostate Profit. We had a chat three years ago, it turns out. So the time flies. Seems like it was uh, two years ago, but it's actually three years ago. We talked about the problem of evil on his channel. And today we're going to be talking about his, uh, his own journey out of Islam, what made him question, what the big issues were that stood out, what he's learned since that time in sev several years of no longer being a Muslim. Uh, I also want to get into some of the videos and debates that he's done. He debated Daniel Hikikichi as well. Um, he also did a really excellent video that caught my attention about the Muslim preacher uh, publicly declares Islam false. And this was surprised me at Daniel's uh, lack of knowledge of the Old Testament and of uh, you know, Jewish and Christian theology. So, uh, Ridvan, thanks for coming on. Uh, thank you for having me. It's uh, it's it's great to be here man, after such a long time. Yeah, man. Um, so let's talk about your journey first out of Islam. Uh, you were raised Muslim, and were you very serious about it? I know you probably told the story a hundred times, but a lot of my audience may not be familiar with your story. So, what's the background like? What what were the what, what's your what's your family like? What how serious were you guys about religion? Um, it was pretty serious for my family all along. It was pretty serious for me uh, after one point. So I grew up in Germany, um, where I was born. My parents are of Turkish origin, and they have always been very uh, religious. Um, it was when we moved to Turkey when I was 16 years old. Uh, I had kind of an identity crisis, was exploring different political ideas and all of that. Um, at some point, uh, something traumatic happened. My my uh, my aunt uh, got got killed. She died, and I had a lot of conversation with her with, with conversations with her before she died about religion and the the meaning of life and things like that. I guess that kind of pushed me toward um, exploring my religious beliefs further. And then I started getting really into um, understanding Islam, um, practicing it, reading the Quran, reading different uh, sources. Um, I practiced it very strictly for several years. And were during you, those were years, you Sunni? Yes, yeah, Sunni, Sunni. Okay. Did you, uh, at this stage, you said you were young, you were like 16, 17, 18, right? Were, were you getting interested in philosophical topics at all? Or was it just purely like a kind of emotional religious attachment that you had now that you were reading these texts, you know, wanting to be immersed in it? Did you start having like, like for me, when I was getting into Christianity, when I was 18, 19, hardcore, I immediately got into philosophy too. I wanted to kind of make it make sense. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Was it like that for you or was it more like just a straight up passionate religious attachment? It was uh, it was different. It was um, I mean, it, it was philosophical slightly on some level, but it was, um, I guess, more of a um, that's I guess that's also philosophical. But it was kind of a it was a search for a meaning yeah. in whatever in in the world I am doing. I, I was in Turkey. Um, I felt very uncomfortable in Turkey. I wasn't used to the to that country, to the culture and the environment and all of that. And um, I was I kind of developed this this distaste, this um, I don't know, I didn't like Turkey very much and how things work mm -hmm. there, how they treat people over there. And um, initially, I guess, with a, with an early young stupidity, I <laughs> went into um, socialism and mm -hmm. then hardcore communism and actually oh, started wow. advocating for a, uh, a violent revolution and things like that. In Turkey? Solution. Yeah, in Turkey. Oh, wow, okay. Um, no, hold on. The, so, so were you still Muslim yeah. when you were getting into the socialist stuff? I was, okay. and that was actually a problem because um, I was also a Muslim the entire time, and I I had this this deep respect for my Muslim beliefs and my my parent my family's uh, Islamic beliefs, and there was always a clash that I couldn't get over because I'm you know I, I'm a communist. I advocate for communism for state atheism, which it entails necessarily, and. Um, but at the same time, I have these religious beliefs and I, I read communist texts that are totally against religion, but I also have my religious beliefs. And um, I guess at some point... Is this, this in your 20s? That was actually very... Uh, that was in my, I don't know, 18 years old. Oh, wow. So okay. I, would say it was, I was... That's uh, pretty heavy stuff for 18, man. 
it was it yeah. was it was <laughs> and um there was a moment i don't know when uh i finally dared to just sit down and 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 tackle that whole issue that clash between my religious beliefs and the communist ideas that i have and i guess it was at, at that point when i thought okay you know what this doesn't there was actually in an article that i read which was um it was uh um a, an interview supposedly between lenin and an imaginary person and it was just it took a bunch of quotes from lenin and it's like i don't know what what that's called it's like it's an interview but it's not and um there was one part where it talks about uh what should happen to the religious population mm -hmm. and how they should be won over and then there is there was a passage of, from from lenin which is taken from one of his speeches um which was about how um they should be appeased at the beginnings and slowly and slowly the religious feelings will be disconnected from them and there will be no necessity for us to you know basically um close their churches and uh buildings down because it will naturally happen and and at that point when i read that i thought to myself okay this is it's getting serious you know <laughs> this doesn't really align with my respect for my religious beliefs and i should have seen that much earlier but mm. and then i broke off from the whole communist idea because I, I felt uncomfortable with it and felt in a void and started going toward islam which is mm -hmm. also which was also connected with my uh, aunt who just died in a very terrible way and that's when i started looking into the quran and religious books and thought wow this is what i needed all along this appeals to my uh search for a meaning all the the answer to all the terrible stuff that is out there did you still have that uh sort of revolutionary fervor when you got back into islam or did that kind of fade away um it's it slowly faded i still had this whole um this image of society is very corrupt uh people are deluded things have to change but it turned from this has to be done by force into um this has to be done by i don't know spreading this religion educating everybody uh, bringing them to the true path and uh i guess the good thing about my religious experience back then is that i turned toward um mysticism which is uh sufism oh you got a Sufi? Islam. really yeah okay. yeah instead of becoming uh this hardcore hardline uh literalist um guy who believes in overthrowing and establishing the caliphate as soon as possible so i was more into mysticism into diving into myself and exploring so now is this in the um this is in your early mid-20s when you start getting into that the Sufi uh, strain I think that was that was um, 19. I began going into all of that stuff. It was around around the age of 19 to 20. That's when I got into into Islam and Sufism heavily. And over the next several years, I was I started um, praying five times a day, uh, spending most of my waking hours with Islam, uh, reading books from different scholars, reading the Quran. The issue is when I was reading the Quran, it's just um, believing that this book is written or you know authored by the Almighty Allah directly, word for word, caused a problem because a lot of the stuff that I read in there was um, didn't really make sense in, in in terms of how the Quran describes the the natural world around us. You know, um, the sky and the sun and the moon and the things that they do. It has. Um, it has a ridiculous description of of, of how things work. There's so you said like the, the cosmology is off. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, okay. yeah. Like the sun travels to a to a resting place, and then there is a place where the sun goes into a muddy spring. <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> now, so is that did, is that why you started seeing uh, Sufism appealing? Because that would allow kind of like allegorization of certain texts. Is that what you're saying? Actually, no. Um, okay. I, I, I found Sufism appealing because I, it, it had a background with my, there was a background with my family. They were, oh. um, they were in, in Sufism and I found that kind of close throughout my life. Plus, um, this whole, my whole constant thinking and inner search for meaning was, you know, that was much more appealing to me. Um, but th that, that whole stuff with the cosmology, um, what that did was <laughs> it, uh, caused a lot of doubts in my mind and 
I kept dismissing those doubts. I kept thinking, well, okay, I shouldn't be thinking about this so much. I'm just a regular human. Mm. Uh, this is the Almighty Allah, His word. I'm, I'm, I'm not supposed to understand these things. So I would try to suppress that uh, those doubts, but they kept coming back. And I read it twice, and I, I encountered even more things that I had a problem with, logical problems, and the this connection between Islam and Abrahamic religion. And the third time I read it, I was in the military, which was obligatory in Turkey. And Are you talking about reading through, reading through the Quran? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. And then at, at that time when I was in the military, I had this whole thing where I thought, okay, I can't suppress this any longer. I have to allow myself to think and to question if Allah is the one who gave me this this mind. And once I opened that door, I feel like there was no coming back. It, it, it fell apart. And I left the religion within one year. And then I was still exploring. And then one year later or so, I just completely let go of my endeavor to figure out whether it is indeed true or not. Well, so let me ask you a question about that. So one thing I noticed, for example, when I was preparing for the, the Daniel Hakikachu debate, one of the books I read was um, Gabriel Said Reynolds's book. It's called The Quran and Its Biblical Subtext. And, you know, he's, he's a just a normal academic Oxford guy. And, you know, he goes through about maybe 12 or 13 case studies where the Quran presents these really difficult and confusing and contradictory narratives and sometimes the narratives are borrowed from older previous texts like scripture the, the bible uh sometimes it's it's stories from uh extra canonical legends like the legend of the sleepers sometimes it's um pseudopagrapha or uh anonymous texts uh like proto-evangelium of james various books that didn't make it into the Christian biblical canon. Anyway, long story short is I noticed as I was reading through this book, what Reynolds would do is he would po point out these difficulty texts and then he would give the way that various Islamic scholars have tried to explain it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just curious, did you notice that the explanation, like why did you not find their, ex I mean, I have my reasons why I didn't think a lot of those explanations <laughs> were very convincing, but wouldn't a Muslim, wouldn't the first thing that a Muslim would say to you, well, come on, Reed Vaughn, why didn't you read our scholars? They explain it away. I guess I was always, um, I always had the tendency to not be pleased with what I perceive as um, explanations that are just given to, you know, to, to pacify you, um, but not to actually explain the problem and to, to solve the problem. And I feel like um, that is very often what happens in, in Islam when you have these questions about the discrepancies between Islam and Abrahamic religion or the cosmology in the Quran. Uh, they give these, these, these vague, um, unsatisfactory answers that just don't solve the problem. For example, um, you, you speak of these these discrepancies. Like I have the the infancy gospels here, which I yeah, um, that's which one. Yeah, you you can you can you can read and uh, you find in there, for example, um, these later stories of Jesus um, giving inanimate birds life. The bird, yeah, yeah, blow, like blowing life into into them, and obviously that there is a context to that right like the context of that is that um the people who wrote this believed that jesus was divine he was more than just just human and he is aside from god the one uh aside from god as as, as they as the people around him knew it the one who um has the who can blow life into inanimate beings but shouldn't this only be reserved for god for some mm -hmm. reason the whole the same story is found in the quran right and in the Quran, Jesus gives life to inanimate beings. And he's the only person aside from Allah who does that. Mm -hmm. But there is no reason to explain why he would do that. And when you ask these questions, you just get these get these answers that don't really solve the problem. Like, oh, yeah. it's just a miracle. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> One thing that came up in, in a lot of the discussions I've had with Muslims is, is various things that, for example, in Jewish or Christian tradition that have a specific purpose or a meaning. They're done in Islam, but there's no explanation as to why. Mm -hmm. In other words, ritual purity, right? So in the Levitical law, there's a cleanliness aspect that's necessary, which has a even a, even in the Old Testament has a moral significance. The Christian reading of that is that we also have ceremonial things, legal things. They might relate to the death of Christ on the cross, for example, the animal sacrifices. Uh, they might relate to uh, moral lessons, something like that. 
But in Islam, there's a lot of the, the things carry over like ritual purity, but we don't really, there's not an explanation as to why we need to be ritually pure. It doesn't really, it doesn't really have a, a purpose other than, well, you just don't do it. I mean, for example, when I debated Azra Rashid, he made a big, a big deal of, I'm not, I didn't even expect this, but he was basically arguing that God could not become incarnate. And I know you may disagree with that. that that's, that's your disagreement. But, but his argument was that God could not become incarnate because to be in the presence of a g- vagina would make him unclean. And it's like, but you believe Allah creates vaginas. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> like wh- why would he create the thing that's unclean? It doesn't make any sense. Right. So the point, point being is that there's a lot of things that are just sort of arbitrary. There's absolutely no purpose to those things. Yeah, um, there is the the issue of, the, I mean, one of the biggest issues in Christianity is, uh, one of the biggest uh, themes in Christianity that Christianity is, is very much based on, as it is uh, known today, is the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. Mm-hmm. And um, in Islam, it just gets very weird, and it's 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 the same thing again. Um, in Islam, Jesus was not crucified according to the Quran. They did not crucify him, nor did they kill him. But didn't Allah sense. trick people into thinking? Yeah, that? Yeah. yeah. But it it appeared so to them. Yeah. So, okay, but why? Why was yeah. he not killed? Why was he not crucified? And when you think about this, where does this narrative come from that he wasn't crucified? And I actually made a video about this uh, um, called "How Islam Gets Jesus Completely Wrong," and um, there, there were later uh, movements among Christians, and especially among Gnostics and uh, Docetic yes. Christians, that um, that believed that Jesus wasn't crucified, that Jesus right. did not die. Uh, that Do- somebody it's called else Do- was, Docetism, yeah, the Docetism. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that somebody else was uh, placed instead of him on the cross, or something else happened. It was an illusion. An illusion but all yeah. of those, all of those have a purpose, right? All of those, they deny that Jesus died because to them Jesus cannot die, or right. Jesus cannot suffer pain because he's above uh, the physical. He's divine. Right. and all of that but then islam adopts the narrative that jesus didn't die and something and it, it just appeared so but there is no reason given why <laughs> and it well, seems our, like our, it isn't there adopts a, those beliefs and isn't there a surah too and i can't remember exactly which one it is but is there a surah that says that allah is also a deceiver yes okay so and, and there's a good paper i read not too long ago and it was a uh, ethics professor arguing that well, if, if Allah is a good deceiver, then this actually kind of negates the possibility of also knowing when Allah is being good and not deceiving. You see? So conceive, a, So yeah. how would we know when there's a deceptive text or, uh, the you know, versus when we're not being deceived by Allah? You see, it would, it would sort of create an epistemic problem. I was going to look for um, a small hadith, a, a, a narration from one of Muhammad's uh, main guys, but he even said something like uh, that he fears the deception of Allah, yeah. you know, that, that even if he was, uh, if one foot was in paradise, he would still be worried about the deception of Allah. And that that's a very interesting thing, right? That the, that the main Muslims are afraid of whether Allah will deceive them or not. Uh, and it does indeed say in the Quran, when it talks about uh, people um, creating a plot against Muhammad and the Muslims in the Quran Allah supposedly says uh, and they they plot or they deceive uh, but Allah deceives too and he's the best of deceivers the best of deceivers that's it yeah yeah Yeah. also I think the second to last I just remember the second to last surah is um, say I seek refuge in the Lord of the daybreak from the evil that he has created (laughs) <laughs> from the evil of the darkness when it enshrouds, from the evil of those who blow up knots, and from the evil of the envier when he envies. To me, it sounds like there's an actual creation of evil, which would be in some way a kind of Manichaeanism or kind of dualism. Um, but but I was going to ask you too about the hadiths because I have I just have this the study Quran, which I think is actually put out by um uh, Nazar Saeed Hossein Nazar, who's I think Sufi, but he, uh, the notes are interesting because a lot of times he'll go to various, you know, Islamic schools and traditions and Akitas and he'll, he'll go give all the different explanations. And, uh, the explanations are, oh, well, he doesn't really create evil. He's also create, it may, might be the creation of shy, you know, Satan it might be the creation of something else. But if you're familiar with, occasionalism are you familiar with that philosophy 
somewhat yeah well the reason i bring that up is that um in the sunni commentary this is a commentary on the creed if you have that that text mm -hmm. Um, by the way, my buddies at Orthodox Shahada told me to reach out to you to do a to do a podcast. The reason I bring this up is because there's a specific except uh, they accept atomism and occasionalism. So there's a there's a de facto acceptance of Greek atomist philosophy, and tied to the atomism is the notion of occasionalism. And what that means is that the that God doesn't create secondary causes. Because that would be to detract from Allah's power if he allowed anything else to be a cause. So basically, the, the early, uh, what, 11th century Sunnis basically came up with the idea that we're going to adopt the atomist position because that's the one where Allah is, Allah is allowed to, or in, in, at every second, he creates and destroys the world again. So this is such a bizarre metaphysic. And it's and but but it also means that every evil event is also directly willed by Allah. Mm -hmm. So in other words, their their metaphysic. Even if somebody were to say, "Well, the Quran doesn't really say that Allah is literally creating evil." No, but your metaphysic of atomism is. And as I understand, all the every traditional Sunni person accepts Greek Greek atomism. And by the way, they don't even know that it's Greek. When I was debating with one of them, I was like, "Well, this comes from Greek philosophers." No, it's from the Quran. No, Greek atomism is not from the Quran, it's from the Greek philosophers, right? <laughs> so it's like, there's a weird sort of anti-philosophical uh, presence in Islam, which I think is a, is, a, is also telling, because as, as I understand you, and I'm going to let you talk here, I'm not trying to hog the, the mic here, but no problem. like when I was looking at Al-Ghazali, Ghazali, right? Al-Ghazali is, is fascinating because it's, it's very philosophical and it's very influenced by Neoplatonism. Mm -hmm. As I understand, Sufism is also influenced by Neoplatonism. But the, the major strands of Islam, you know, in terms of Sunni Islam, uh, maybe Shia and maybe Sufi could be influenced by Neoplatonism. It'd be philosophical. It seems like Shia Islam is not that philosophical. It actually historically has opposed philosophy because it's too too you can't in other words reasoning is frowned upon is what i'm getting at yeah um and it's not just that it's also um in in the current time the traditionalist uh strain of islam which has um which has become really popular since the whole uh revivalism movement in the 20th century um there has been a lot of opposition to uh to philosophical thinking within islam and um that that stance was also quite popular throughout history um, it, among mainstream uh, scholars. There was um, Muslims might want you to think that there has always been this great unity among the right. Sunni Muslims, but that was not the case. Even among Sunni Muslims, not just between Sunni and Shia Muslims, there were uh, there were huge fights, huge debates, people being executed simply for. Uh, arguing over the definition of whether um of the quran's createdness yeah uh, right. whether you can say that the quran is created or not and uh, whether you can say it's uh it is uncreated uh permanently and and, and you know it's it's a whole huge discussion and um and uh one position which is a traditionalist uh, literalist position is basically that you should simply read the quran and accept and do not ask how that's yeah. an actual actual quote uh it's an actual fundamental way yeah. of thinking do do not ask how and uh that has been a very prominent idea G ghazali for example was was he was a deep thinker i i actually have a have a book here which was my favorite book when i was a when i was a muslim which is um the alchemy of happiness i loved it because it was very short uh, very succinct and um he was going quite deep into the spiritual there mm -hmm. but um you're right. Uh, Muslim scholars have always dealt with the whole problem of um, of the pre of predestination of where good and evil comes from, because the Quran seems to be quite unclear on that. The Quran, uh, in the Quran, Allah accuses the uh, those who sin and those who do evil and those who disbelief of being responsible for uh, their actions. But at the same time, it mm -hmm. repeatedly says some quite confusing things, like um, like uh, even if you tried you could not uh change their minds because only allah decides whether they believe or not uh allah leads astray and allah guides whomever he wills uh nobody can believe unless allah wants him to believe and things like that and then yeah it's predestinarian in a, in a very strict way and and, and 
the metaphysics of, of atomism is also predestinarian and that we're just backing up that the Sunni, the medieval Sunni acceptance of the atomist view is another attestation to that strict predestinarianism. I wanted to ask you too, another thing that comes up and, and we don't have to shift away from the Quran, but uh, a lot of people make a, uh, a lot of fuss over the hadiths. And I think in a lot of these debates, when, you know, Daniel's out there or, or anybody else is out there, they're not, they're not typically going to the hadith. They're usually wanting to try to prove the truth of, of the Quran by the fact that it was preserved. I don't know how preservation in any way proves that it's true or false. I mean, the Bhagavad Gita, you know, the, these, these texts are more ancient than, than the Quran. They're well-preserved. Does it make them true? Um, error can be, can be well-preserved. So, the real thing though that i've noticed that where things get really wacky and I'm, that's not to say that the quran itself doesn't have strange parts it does but a lot of these hadiths even the ones that are the strong hadiths they have some pretty wacky things don't they <laughs> they do <laughs> that's an understatement uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. uh, it, the preservation actually um bart ehrman um commented on that and he had a he had a discussion with uh, a muslim apologist muhammad hijab um that was like the Muslim apologists were trying to basically use him due to his criticism of Christianity right. to, to validate their uh, their Islamic beliefs. And then he just, um, he completely sold them out, you could say, and uh, <laughs> and basically explained to them that his views don't align very much with Islam at all, that Islam uh, doesn't seem to make sense in its, in its uh, ideas. And um, his point was also, even if it's completely preserved, and even if there is no contradiction, that doesn't mean anything to me at all, because I could say the same thing about a phone book or about yeah. uh, the yeah. different things. Uh, but yeah, the hadiths are, um, are a big issue. And um, so normally, among the mainstream Sunni Muslims, uh, including Daniel Hikichu and the others, uh, the majority of the hadiths that you read in any uh, hadith source today, or that you can find in this book, like I have this summarized uh, Sahih Bukhari, which is like, um, Bukhari is the number one book in terms of uh, the hadiths. It has, it has um, almost entirely authenticated hadiths in there. Right. And uh, the by average, the way, I was just asking somebody for a book on that. <laughs> so I'm glad you yeah. I'm glad you have that. I'm gonna this get is that. actually um, yeah, this is uh, it has a it's an all in one without repetitions. This, this Bulgari is normally very long, but this right. book is uh, it summarizes it removes repetitions and makes it uh, shorter. It's still nice. Yeah, I'm gonna get that. Thanks. But uh, you should you should do that. And uh, if you just start from the beginning, you already see some really interesting stuff, like how Muhammad uh, received his revelations, and it explains how Muhammad uh, would um, he would start hearing the sound of a ringing bell in his ears. Um, then he would sometimes pass out, and he would see a strange figure coming toward him and communicating things to him, hmm. and he would collapse on the ground. He would uh, sweat even on a on a on a not so hot day, uh, make sounds like the snorting of a camel, the snorting of a camel. It says, like, wow. and uh, <laughs> and they would cover him up and keep him like that, and then he would uh, gather himself after a while and just like oh, Allah said, so and so and so and so and so. And and the thing is, if you uh, if you, if you analyze it completely from a I guess from a scientific point of view, that that's uh, what what is described there sounds very much like he had a um, a neurological yeah or, like schizophrenia or yeah, yeah something like that yeah wow yeah, yeah. interesting and also other things like um, that he sees one of his uh, one of his followers everybody else sees that guy but. Um, he then says, oh, that was actually Gabriel. And everyone is confused because everyone saw that guy. That was, that was the guy that is always around. And he's like, no, it was, it was Gabriel. Uh, Gabriel looks just like him. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's really weird stuff, you know? And yeah. <laughs> well, uh, it, it, for those that don't know in the audience, so in Islam, you kind of have this tradition of the collection of oral statements. Um, if you're, you know, Christianity has oral tradition in the church. Judaism has oral tradition, the Talmud, these kinds of things. So basically, in Islam, you have this collection of what are called hadiths, which are the traditions that kind of elucidate the life of Muhammad and, and elements of how the, the Quran was um, supposedly revealed, right? And yeah. amongst these, there's these classes of weak to strong, right? Who decides that, by the way? Is it just like random noted scholars over the year? Like who decided the weak from the strong? I could say, um, to be very honest and fair here, that that is um, that is probably 
the most um, admirable, in my personal opinion, um, kind of study in Islam. But um, the bar is the bar there is actually not very high because Islam is not very very complex. But um, so there, there is a whole branch of Islamic studies, which is uh, the Hadith studies, uh, which again branches out into um, analyzing all the people who transmitted these uh, oral traditions, the people who wrote them down, uh, their reliability, uh, studies on the text, studies on the language and things like that. And, and um, the studies of that have been around uh, for quite a while. They started around like, I don't know, two centuries after the death of Muhammad, when uh, people started going around and collecting oral uh, traditions. Um, Bukhari is one of those guys who is said to have collected like thousands of them and then uh, put them in, in a book. He's supposed to have uh, dismissed the vast majority of the narrations that were told to him and only recorded those that are like, um, that can be verified through multiple nar narrators and uh, things like that. Gotcha. And then over the years, other scholars come and um, decide, okay, this one is reliable, this one is reliable, this one is not reliable. There are some big issues with that though. Like, um, for example, that off, off the start, they rejected any quote any tradition that came from somebody who is not a Muslim and who is known to be uh, very immoral. So, you know, the problem is you have a real bias here off the yeah. very beginning, from the very beginning, because yeah. if you don't listen to the non-Muslims, if you don't listen to the to, to those who are considered immoral by their standards. Well, yeah, it would be immoral all, based yeah. on who we say is immoral. So therefore, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, it's picking yeah, and choosing, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you have only only those who, who want to say good stuff and only Muslims in the sources, and then you have a completely biased uh, source. A biased well, this seems to be this seems to be a prevailing issue, and I admit that this this kind of bias can exist, obviously, amongst any position, yeah. uh, Christians, anybody can have this kind of bias. But one thing that kept frustrating me in the debate was the first uh, you know hour and a half of the debate with Daniel was the inability to to convey to him and i don't know if he just didn't get it or he didn't want to get it or maybe he got it later in the debate that like if the the quran is saying you can go to the older prior revelation right you can't just turn around and say that but the older prior revelation is only what the quran says you see because if i'm a seventh century jew or christian and i'm going to verify what the quran says and the quran tells me to go to my texts that's assuming then that the texts aren't corrupted because otherwise I couldn't verify it. And then Daniel says, yeah, you do that, but then you verify it on the basis of what's consistent with the Quran, which is ridiculous, right? right? Which is ridiculous. <laughs> and it's amazing to me that he never throughout the debate got that. And it's like, there was three times in discussion where I didn't, and I, I didn't expect this, but he didn't seem to know what the, the fallacies were. He, it's like, he'd never heard of logical fallacies. And I'm just wondering if that's kind of like for a Muslim, if, if you're kind of Daniel's sort of strict, uh, you know, approach, like, because I know Dr. Hashmi debated Daniel, and I'm sure he believes in logical fallacies. But but for Daniel, it'd be like, well, if I was to to give authority to logical fallacies, that would be detracting from Allah, maybe. Right. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, what yeah. is there a, basically you have to surrender logical consistency to maintain the system. Does that make sense? Pretty much, yes. Uh, especially if we're talking about Daniel Kikichu. I had a live stream with um, with this guy. His, uh, his, he's known as Digital Gnosis, um, where I invited him. We decided to sit down and just uh, go through a whole debate between Daniel Kikichu and this guy, uh, T-Jump, and then to uh, <laughs> to make note of all the logical fallacies that Daniel Kikichu uh, makes. And it's it's we just had to pause the entire time because it's very ironic. Uh, he loves to say that his opponent is is, is gish galloping, but then he does yeah. the same thing over yeah. and over again. Um, he always does this false dichotomy of uh, you are either this or you are that. He's like, well, if you don't have Islam, then you see what happens. You have people going around becoming drug addicts and dying in the streets. Dude, really? Is, is that <laughs> is that what the world looks like? You are either Muslim or you are, you know, a drug addict <laughs> dying in a, to in a public toilet. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a terrible argument. Yeah. Yeah. Things like that. And um, 
I don't think Daniel Kikichu is a very is a very dumb person. I think he he is to an extent quite intelligent. But mm -hmm. uh, the the problem is that being going for this traditionalist view of Islam just makes you makes you dumb for a reason yeah. out of necessity. Right. And um, there is a lot of denial that has to be in your head. There is a lot of cognitive dissonance that has to remain, uh, where you always go for the Islam option in order to maintain your, your beliefs. And that topic of uh, of going back to the Christian and Jewish sources, that's actually a challenge that uh, David Wood and I, uh, we have offered this whole, whole uh, dilemma a lot to Muslims. We have made live streams, challenges. We had, we had people on to challenge us. Uh, we said, so the, the Quran says clearly right. uh, that you should, that the Christians and Jews should go and read the books that they have. It even reprimands them at one point. It says, why do they come and ask you when they have what we revealed to them? So <laughs> it's very clear that the Jew in Muhammad's time or the Christian in Muhammad's time should go to his own source and read that according to the Quran. And the Quran never says that uh, the previous scriptures were actually corrupt. Corrupted, right. All it says is that that they distort it with their with their mouths or they cover it up. You know, and so this whole idea that it was uh, corrupted, that it was di distorted, only developed over the over the. That's a later centuries. critical yeah. argument, right? And, and by the way, I don't think anybody takes it seriously. That Daniel was arguing that the critical scholars would support Islam. That's what higher critical scholar would support the, the Islam. The Quran. <laughs> Again, even if you admit that there's an early date Quran that's preserved, uh, I forget the name of some of those manu manuscripts. Uh -huh. it has nothing to do with whether it's true or false. Yeah. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't. And, you have, and you have to think. I mean, you just pointed it out. Um, we're talking about the seventh century, seventh right. century Arabia. Uh, even the seventh century, Allah supposedly or Muhammad uh, say that they have the gospel and the Torah, as as the Quran says, right. and that they can go there and read it. Then we have to somehow assume that between then and now, those scriptures uh, got corrupted and lost into oblivion is that possible it's not possible we yeah. have the texts from prior to that time so right exactly yeah the old that's why i kept saying that the older revelation is relevant here mm -hmm. and then he tried to twist and say oh so you're saying it's older because it's true no no no. i'm saying that the older revelation is what your book tells me to go to yeah, you see? yeah. so the, his, the historicity does matter and it's different for a christian because i know that you're not a christian but i'm saying that the positions aren't equivalent because he was trying to equivocate and say, well, you have the same problems. You try to go to the Old Testament and make it say what you want. And then you reject other parts. No, we don't. So that's not there's two different positions. If my position was rejecting the prior revelation, it would be that you would be correct. But the argument is about, as I was trying to frame it, continuity between the Old Testament, and the New Testament, and is is then Islam in continuity with the Torah and the prophets. That's why I thought it was really important. And I, I've never heard Muslims really go into this. You had a lot more experience with this. So I want to get your comment on this. Maybe you maybe you think it's not a very effective approach, but my background being very grounded in a lot of, you know, reading the Old Testament. I was when I was a Protestant, I was involved in some groups that were very heavily uh, Old Testament oriented. So I, I grew up knowing that very well. And I never have heard or, or grasped any significance because it's a huge part of the torah and the prophets the place of the temple the levitical uh priesthood the sacrifice the altar the incense the imagery the icon iconography is what you, what you could call solomon's temple um and, and and i've never heard this explained in islam now in christianity even if you think christianity is false it still has a significant explanation and place for all those things and a continuity with priesthood uh, Eucharist sacrifice, all this kind of stuff. Islam is just like, oh, that was all kind of like stuff that Allah just kind of gave to Solomon or something. And then, and, and it even says weird stuff like we gave Solomon temples. There was one temple, not many. What are you talking about temples? Like, mm -hmm. it's almost like there was all of these. It's like they don't understand the Old Testament is what I'm trying to say. That, that's very much, that's very much the conclusion that I got to when I was um, 
as I was leaving Islam, as I was on the verge of it, and I was studying the Quran and um, and and kind of also studying Abrahamic religion and figuring out what in the world happened here because of the disconnection. And it looks like it just looks like the author of the Quran, uh, Muhammad, uh, and the early scholars had no idea about uh, about Christianity, about Judaism, about the the Old Testament, the New Testament, about these scriptures at all. The Quran keeps talking about the Injil, uh, which is yeah. the gospel, right. which um, which the only thing that is that was known at that time as the gospel is the collection of the four gospels uh, put into into one book, or sometimes they would refer to the New Testament entirely as the gospel. Right. Uh, but uh, it says uh, that Allah revealed the gospel uh, to Jesus, or Allah gave the gospel to to Jesus, and it it speaks of it as a book. Uh, it's which is just. We all know that's not how it worked, right? We, we know that the Gospels are not something that were <laughs> right. uh, revealed from Allah. The book that to, fell out of heaven, yeah. Yeah, or revealed from Allah to a person, and then you know it, it became it turned into a one book. It was it was it was written through a completely right. different process. Um, I, I will do you one better. It's uh, one of the main things that actually pushed me kind of away was uh, <laughs> I sat there one day and thought about the Kaaba, which is which happens to be the the main image that everyone gets when you think about Islam. And I thought, um, wait a minute. So we are always told about the Kaaba that uh, that it is the first house f built for Allah by mankind in Islam, that it is such an important spot that uh, that Abraham was there, that it was so important to him and so on. But what is the history of it? And I mean, you, you can easily find that, that there is no history to the Kaaba prior to the uh, the emergence of Islam, maybe it is it is hinted at, or maybe it is mentioned in a few uh, sources, but it has little to no significance. Uh, nobody knows about it. It has no connection to Abrahamic religion. Right. Uh, Abraham is not known to have ever gone to that region in the uh, in the Old Testament. Right. Uh, and and um, none of the prophets. Nobody has any connection to that region at all. And I, I analyze this in length. And I also sat down with. Um, with uh, an, a scholar on uh, Near Eastern studies and Near Eastern religion, I forgot his name. Shame, but uh, but but you you can you, you you conclude clearly that the Kaaba has no connection whatsoever to Abrahamic religion when it is supposed to have when it must have that connection. All it does have is it has a connection to or a significance to the pre-Islamic Arab polytheists. Hey, isn't it pagan? Yeah, who yeah. had several such buildings around Arabia. Right. And it was it was a common thing to have a, a cube or a similar building and to attach a stone to it, which is probably a, a meteorite, and uh, right. to then think this was sent down by God or by the gods and is an object of worship. And that's all it is. And the Quran and Islam adopts that building as the center of worship that everyone is supposed to, you know, face and pray to, representative of Allah. That, but, that, but it doesn't make any sense. It has no well, I mean, script, there, you, the scriptures of the, I mean, I, Islam says in, I forget which sure it is, but, you know, there's nothing like Allah. So I've, I've always wondered, why are we able to do this? Why, why would we have this sort of created, uh, I mean, it's almost like what a Christian would call a sacrament, right? But, yeah. But, but how does that, how does that happen? I mean, if a created thing is nothing like, Allah or the the 99 names or whatever there's a there's a total severance between the created and the uncreated is what I'm trying to say so how then do we have holy things in in this system does that make sense what I'm saying yeah yeah um I guess the sentiment there is a bit different it's like um so when you when you uh, when you explore the idea of praying toward the Kaaba for example in Islam um the idea there is that it is uh simply a place that is favored by Allah and that he wants all people to come to and to be around and the 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 the, the imminent place around it is considered uh, protected and holy which is funny because the pagans had that idea they treated uh, that as a as a sanctuary which uh, which whose surroundings are holy sacred you cannot fight there and so on it is months hmm. you go there and you circle it and the stone is also still important the stone still carries an importance in Islam and the stone is said to um, to basically 
almost you know record your your reverence and your respect toward it when you go there and when, oh, you, when you go to really? pilgrimage and muhammad would uh point at it and go like allah Akbar and point at it he would go there and kiss it and rub it and so uh, here's what i'm trying to, I, i'm just trying, like how is that not idolatry given the attitude of the that's what I'm trying to figure out here. Yeah, and, and I mean, I, I'm not trying to be petty. Like, what steel man that right? Like, what's their best explanation for for that? Um, I would like to give you an explanation, but uh, I ask this question very often, and I, I even made some some. Um, I mean, I made some some analysis on how that just screams idolatry. And the answers you get are just oh, no, 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 no. It's not idolatry because in this case it is just, you know, Allah wanted us oh, to be. Oh, so He just willed it. Okay. Yeah, He just willed. He just, He willed it. He wanted us to have That's unity it. and to focus on Him there. But you learn things like the black stone will speak, will uh, speak, in heaven, and will tell and, and will basically say, okay, this guy, uh, he was there. He did this. He did that. <laughs> and you are supposed to go and kiss and worship it, which is something that pre-islamic polytheists yeah which pagans did to them it was of importance because it was a fertility symbol they would go to it and they would uh throw um throw uh they would shoot arrows next to it and uh then say okay this this arrow landed uh in front of this other one this means that the god of this kaaba uh wants us to to do option two not option mm -hmm. one he's pleased with that so th that that's what it was you know it was a very primitive uh way of worshiping their their idols and islam just adopts it and just goes with it and nobody asks why <laughs> gotcha yeah uh one thing too going back to a lot of that old testament imagery that's inexplicable in in terms of the quran uh, we were looking at cases where there's all the references in the Quran to the temple, the ark, the covenant, uh, the Levitical uh, ceremonial aspects. And in all of these instances, we have, we have a whole chart of it we drew out. Um, there's, there's fundamental misunderstandings. For example, the ark of the covenant seems to be treated like it's a box, a magic box that flies around. And it's like it's like a treasure chest that that's moses is like family jewels so they thought that like the the chest was like where moses stored his jewels and then it would fly to david and solomon so yeah. they didn't understand that it's a box with the you know the two cherubim or the, excuse me the seraphim on the top right mm -hmm. so because it's a box with wings winged angels they thought that meant that the box flies yeah. so it's a very fun I mean, I mean it's a very fundamental misunderstanding of what the box the ark of the covenant was and to me that just suggests that well they really misunderstood what all of those things were even if you thought they were false like that's not the meaning of those things and i think you did a video mm -hmm. where you were pointing out that it's not just like the ark of the covenant and the old testament ceremonies like it, it mis misunderstands jesus right it misunderstands so much when it comes to uh when it comes to christianity and when it comes to uh so when it comes to the New Testament and the Old Testament, it misunderstands so many things. You're right. It, it refers to, um, it just speaks of it as the remnants of, of Moses and his, uh, and how Solomon speaks of uh, on it. And uh, it, it has, it, it doesn't explain what it is. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of, uh, of something related to that, because I, I actually did a video of that on, on that quite long ago. Or ev even the, the Ten Commandments, I, <laughs> it's... Um, in the Quran, it talks about uh, the. It talks about Moses in a very um, disconnected, w weird way, and it basically says, "And Allah gave him gave him these these tablets. He gave mm -hmm. him these stones. Mm -hmm. In it, he wrote down uh, something of all things, and Moses was then told to basically tell them." what it is and there were good tidings in it but it never specifies what in the world it actually is it oh, never really? talks about the ten commandments huh. uh, the idea of the ten commandments doesn't be doesn't even exist in, in, in the quran it is oh, something wow. that muslims take from uh from christians and jews from the, the knowledge that they get from from studying you know right there, there is no clear mention of it you read the story of moses and you have no clue what it's all about <laughs> <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> well that's something that reynolds noted that in quite a few of these stories that the Quran will kind of make passing references to people in the Old Testament that are kind of minor, like the rebellion of Korah or Jonah, right? Yeah. Jonah's whole story is repeated almost in, in its entirety. 
some of the details are actually mixed up and don't make sense. But this, the, 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 the wildest part about that was that, and it was just a passing comment that, that Reynolds made was that he said that Jonah is given the significance in the Quran. And yet the Quran doesn't give any significance to the major and minor prophets of the old Testament. So there's no significance given to, they might be mentioned by name, but Isaiah, I mean, Isaiah is one of the most important. Yeah. I mean, it's a gigantic book in the old Testament, Ezekiel gigantic book of the old Testament. And it's like, you miss it. You missed this, this, I mean, let's say for a Christian, uh, even especially amongst Eastern Christians, like Afra, the Persian, various uh, Eastern Syriac Christians at that time, if they had heard, I should go check my books to see that it is consistent with the Quran. One of the first things they're going to think about is Isaiah, yeah. which to Christians has often been considered quote, the fifth gospel, mm -hmm. but this is completely absent. I mean, maybe Isaiah is mentioned by name in the Quran. I'm, not, I'm actually not sure if he's mentioned, it's, by it's name. Not, it's not. But there's no significant. This is huge. This is crazy. Yeah, I also uh, I immediately think of Isaiah when you when you talk of uh, prophets that are uh, of huge significance in Abrahamic religion, but that are not mentioned in, in Islam at all. And um, so, yeah, I, Isaiah is is one of those one of those um, that have no significance, and that's that's, that's just that's wild. That's that's crazy. Well, to because... me, that just demonstrates <laughs> no understanding of the meaning of the Old Testament, right? Yeah, and it has it has another the another issue is Ezra. I mean, Ezra uh, has a plays a big role in the history of uh, of Israel. Well, all of the synagogue system yeah. comes from Ezra setting up the yeah. synagogues. Yeah, yeah, but the Quran it doesn't mention it doesn't talk about Ezra at all, except at one po point where it uh, mentions in Quran chapter nine verse uh, thirty, um, where it mentions somebody named Uzair, which is assumed to be Ezra, and. <laughs> It says, uh, and the Jews say Ezra, uh, the Jews say Uzair is the son of Allah, and the Christians say the Messiah is the son of Allah. This is their saying from their mouths, and uh, they are deluded. May Allah destroy them. And then you are left with, wait, what? The Jews say Uzair is the son of Allah? And then that's not it. You go into the Hadith. In the Hadith, you find um, several reports in which uh, Muhammad talks about the Day of Judgment. And he explains that um, on the Day of Judgment, Allah will call the Christians and he will say to them, what did you worship? And they will say, we worship the Messiah, son of Allah. And uh, he will then say, well, you were wrong. He will punish them and he will send them to hell. Then he will call upon the Jews. He will ask them, "Why? what did you worship? The Jews will say, we worshiped Uzair, the son of Allah. And Allah will punish them for that and send them to hell. I, I know. That's, you Wait, find so that... they're confusing Ezra with that it, the Jews worship Ezra? Yeah, the, the Quran claims that the Jews worshipped uh, Ezra or Uzair as the son of God and are therefore deluded just the way Christians worship Jesus as the son of God and are therefore deluded. And to this day, this is like nobody knows what in the nobody world knows what it means, what that is about. So it's just a confusion. Then it. Yeah. yeah. OK. When, when you when you talk about it, when you ask Muslims about it, uh, the one of, some of the responses are uh, the Quran was talking about uh, you know, a specific group of Jews in there in that time, in that environment that actually did worship uh, Ezra oh. as the son of God. OK, but who are those people? Where are those people? Do we know anything? No. Yeah, it's no just clear. ad hoc, right? No sign. But then uh, but then you also have the Hadith in which it, 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 in which it makes it look like all of the Jews are doing that. I see. And it's just ignorance, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's great. And same with, like, you know, Daniel seemed, didn't seem to get the point that, like, if, let's say the first 10 surahs, uh, they reference, validate, and assume gigantic portions of the Old Testament, particularly mm -hmm. the Torah. So you have things like David's uh, life and history, his conquest. You have the Exodus story being mentioned. You have a lot of the cosmology of Satan and the fall and Genesis and Adam being mentioned. So you have all of these things that assume that those stories and the, the recounting of them is correct because the stories are mentioned in passing. Mm -hmm. well, where else would I go to hear about David and his conquests other than the, these texts, right? So that's why I asked him the question, well, then what is the principle that would tell you when the texts are, are true and false? The Quran. That's that's the whole issue with the yeah. Quran. Um, 
What is very confusing to me is uh, growing up with my family, uh, they are religious. They, they had collections of some um, movies that were made by Muslims about uh, certain prophets or other figures. And they would tell the story of, uh, you know, for example, Joseph, um, stories of other individuals. And, uh, and later on, when I was uh, diving into studying Islam, I was wondering, okay, wait a minute, we I, I watched those those movies, and they tell these elaborate stories of these of these prophets, some about uh, Mary or and, and Jesus, for example. Uh, but where do these where does the knowledge come from? Because this is not in the Quran. And it turns out, of course, it's not in the Quran. It's, this is, it doesn't come from the Quran. It doesn't come from the Muhammad. Where it comes from is Islamic scholars over time uh, took that whole stuff from, uh, from the Christians and Jews, while also proclaiming that the previous scriptures cannot be trusted and should not be read because they have been corrupted. But wait a minute, how does that work? <laughs> yeah, and it's it's just it it's incoherent. It doesn't make any sense. You, on one hand, you are told that those sources are unreliable. Yeah. You should abstain from them entirely. On the other hand, you take much of your knowledge about these prophets from uh, those books. Exactly. E even even Daniel, which is uh, Daniel, is very ironic. His name is his name Daniel. Daniel is not is not a is not a name that is known in in Islam. Uh, comes from Abrahamic religion. The fact that right. he has that name. Uh, is actually very funny. Somebody should confront him on that one. Day. I, well, I, when I became when I my Orthodox name is Daniel, so that's funny. I should have mentioned that. <laughs> but but uh, I, I didn't realize that when Gabriel Reynolds was saying that the nobody, none of these major and minor prophets are even mentioned. I wasn't sure if he was saying like literally not mentioned in terms of like their names at all, or like the stories are not told. Like, like is is the name? Daniel not even referenced in the Quran? No, it's not. And, uh, and not Isaiah either. isn't either? Isaiah isn't either. Is it I had a, I have a list that I put together um, okay. of, of all those. I'm trying to find this. I think it's think also Ezekiel here. is? Uh, Ezekiel, um, I think Ezekiel, I think there is a mention of somebody named uh, Dhul Kifl, and that is assumed to be Ezekiel, okay. as far as uh, as far as I, I remember. I didn't study that very deeply. Um, but that is one yeah, and they say that might be Ezekiel, but nobody really knows. You also have a book in the Quran that is mentioned um, that Allah revealed, which is the Zabur, aside from the Injil, which is the Gospel, and the, and the Torah, which is the Torah. You have a book uh, named Zabur, which was revealed to David, according to the Quran. Huh. Okay, what is that book? And Islamic studies concluded at some point that it must be referring to the Psalms. Uh, I was going to ask about the Psalms next. Yeah, yeah, the Psalms. But um, but then you look at the Psalms and what they are, and you start you, you go through the Psalms, and right. much of it is just so not in alignment with Islamic beliefs. Right, and it's also not something that was that was revealed to or given to David as a book. It was. Uh, I mean, there is a very complex well, david wrote songs history. right yeah, yeah it's not like a book was transmitted to him he was writing a song like a like a yeah. musician would write a song exactly because they're yeah. actually it's actually the liturgical worship that was done at the tabernacle mm -hmm. in the temple so yeah it's again that's a great point i actually hadn't even thought about that that when it's talking about the book of the Injil or the book like they're thinking of it as an actual text Mm -hmm. that's like channeled or something right <laughs> right yeah that's why you can find muslims today uh the average muslim you can find them say stuff like um the, the injil and the and the Torah and the zabur they were revealed by allah to them but they corrupted uh those revelations which is why they don't make sense uh so they just imagine the whole thing like the quran which was supposedly yes. through right. the angel jibreel revealed to muhammad and then spoken by him and recorded by others around him and turned yes. into a book they imagine it all like that and this is uh one of the major signs of the ignorance of you know islam and um, the ignorance by Muslims and by Muhammad on what scripture is, what it and is how, yeah. how previous scripture came into existence. Exactly. But yeah, um, the, the number of prophets mentioned in the Quran is, I think, around, um, I'm trying to remember, uh, 20, something between 20 and 30. And uh, it's, it's, it's part of the, of the names that are known in Abrahamic religion. Many of them are not mentioned at all. 
plus some people that are not prophets are treated as prophets like uh like lot for example oh who wow is not a who is not a prophet is right a prophet in huh islam uh, which and he didn't play a prophetic role i know to right me. it's just a... <laughs> but in islam he's a prophet well let's talk about another one of those names which is a big uh oopsie and that's the name of yahweh i couldn't believe this this when you made this video uh and and i missed it it was from a year ago i'm glad you sent it to me now i had to play this multiple times because i kind of couldn't believe it i was like what? he actually thinks that what how did on the earth did he come to the believe that the name yahweh is a pagan name that's what i don't understand i understand if a person doesn't believe the religion and they i know about you know l and canaanite religion and l is kind of a generic term for deity just like a deity could refer to uh, allah it could refer to yahweh it could refer to a canaanite god it could refer to an angel or a demon right the word deity divinity or even l just means amongst the class of the gods or god mm -hmm. so where did he get this idea that Yahweh is a pagan name? This is so bizarre. Did he just make it up? I can guess that um, here's a funny thing. I uh, Before I talked to him, before I had that conversation with him, I, I kind of, uh, I was very, I would say, I could say obsessed with that topic because it was like uh, months before, maybe a year before, I discovered that this is actually a huge problem and that nobody's talking about it. Could you, so can you I, outline this problem for us? Yeah, the problem is uh, basically that the name Yahweh is never mentioned in the Quran. It is never mentioned in Islamic scripture. Uh, it is never referenced, never known. In Islam, uh, Allah is, uh, is is the proper name of of God, of Allah. It is nobody else can have that name. Nothing else can be referred okay. to by that. So it's a proper, so, a proper yeah, name. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not just, it, not, it doesn't just mean God. It's not just a right. title. It is his actual name. And he says, I am Allah. And it's his number one name. Um, but but in, in Abrahamic religion, the, you, know, you, you know that uh, God is referred yeah. to as, as Eloh or Elohim or Tetragrammaton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With other titles, but then his actual name, which explicitly is mentioned several times, and it says, uh, "This will be my name forever." Right. Is, is Yahweh. Right. And um, and and that is known by Jews and Christians. Oh yeah. yeah. It doesn't play any role in Islam at all. So huh. okay, where is the where is the where is the disconnection happening here? And um, when you dive deeper into it, you just you just uh, recognize that whoever authored the Quran, if it was Muhammad or the people around him, um, they simply took this, uh, the one God as Allah from the Christians and Jews, but uh, never it never the, dawned on them that, the, that, yeah. that God has a name, Yahweh, <laughs> which is understandable because the Christians and Jews never mentioned the name because of the, you know, because of the sanctity, because of the importance and yeah. the, the, the fear by the Jews, especially of mentioning yeah. that name. Yeah. So, so no Muslim became ever aware that that all oh, that God actually has a name. So it never made it into the Islamic religion. Uh, but you, you could say, okay, no big importance. The name is not mentioned, whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, the issue is when you ask Muslims what the name of Allah is, they will say Allah, and they will refer to these 99 names that are mentioned that right. are his qualities in the Quran. Right. They will not accept that Yahweh is actually his, his name that it is supposed to be his eternal name. The problem arises. That's a great from argument. Him. I mean, that would be really, there's no way to deny that that's the prophetic religion. Yeah. In, in other words, I mean, my debate with Daniel was what's the religion of the prophets, right? So if we're talking about Moses, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, the prophets, right? And is, is therefore Muhammad then in line with him? Well, one thing you might want to know as a prophet is the name of your God. <laughs> I mean, right? <laughs> yeah. And the, the problem is, um, you could say Yahweh is never mentioned in the Quran, but that's actually not entirely true. Now wait for it. Yahweh is mentioned indirectly in the Quran because you have uh, four prophets in the Quran that are mentioned whose names are theophoric names, which reference yeah. Yahweh as Yah and uh, or, or in other forms. And those are uh, Jesus, <laughs> uh, John, Zechariah and uh, and Elijah. Those four names are in the Quran. And what's what's actually very interesting is there is even a Quran verse which mentions only those four prophets oh, wow. in one in one verse and right. says that they are righteous people right. uh, of, of Allah. But um, and then you also have mentioned in the Quran that Allah uh, gave Jesus his name 
So he said his name will be will be Isa. And about John, you have the same thing, whose name will be Yahya, it says. Yeah, yeah. But, okay, all of those four names reference Yahweh. They're derivative yeah. of Yahweh, yeah. Yeah, Jesus means uh, Yahweh, Yahweh is, is salvation. Yeah, saves, yeah. Saves. Yeah. Um, Zechariah is uh, remember Yahweh, or Yahweh remembers. Uh, Yahya is Yah lives, uh, or John, Yah lives. And the funniest of these is, um, Elijah literally means, my God is Yahweh. <laughs> it's, it literally means Man. my God is Yahweh. So well now, okay. I, yeah, now I mean that's really devastating. So I'm glad that you really pressed the issue with him on that. And so I guess what it was he just sort of googling uh, on the spot, yeah. and he found some website that said it's a pagan name. I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, what what he went to is uh, you can you can see very clearly that he's googling while I'm talking yeah. about this there, and uh, he had this concer concerned look and trying to figure out what's what's happening here, and then he came he comes to the conclusion, which is one of the scholarly conclusions at the moment that one of the theories is that yeah. Yahweh was a, a name of a God prior right. to uh, you know, the, the Hebrew people yeah. adopted that name. Uh, and, and he just gave that as an answer. And he clearly said, the pagan name Yahweh, yeah. they adopted it. And then yeah, I know, clipped they, it because he, he said, yeah. I never said that he kept saying, I never said that. <laughs> Yeah. And yeah, I didn't explain to my audience. What do you mean? <laughs> I explained to my audience, if you claim that this is a pagan name, then you cannot possibly explain why the Quran explicitly mentions several names, including uh, it says about two of those that Allah himself gave those names. Why would Allah himself uh, tell pagan people, name. give yeah. pagan names to, to people? It doesn't make sense. Yeah. And, Interesting. It's 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 devastating, and it's one of those things that they don't know any way out of the argument. Well, I didn't realize until you you, you know you were making this argument that I think prior to watching your video and that exchange you had, I would have assumed that they thought of it as just kind of a a, na a name that refers to one God, right? Like the word God, G O D, right? Mm -hmm. But for like if you're if you go to an Orthodox church uh in that, that speaks arabic um the arabic liturgies in the orthodox church use the word allah just mm -hmm. because it's the arabic word for god right yeah but they're yeah. saying no no no, it's an actually proper name yeah it's the way that we would consider yahweh right yeah. the name of god his yeah. proper name allah is the proper name well then where does why is the name of god of the prophets no longer significant in in terms of you know continuity that, that's when you that's, ask, that's an amazing yeah. objection i mean that's crazy and when you ask that question they uh most muslims have never thought about it for right. some reason this is not a discussion that has uh has a long history i don't know it's, it's still a surprise to me i feel like um i noticed this one day and i started diving into it and i remember i remember bringing this up to david i was like hey, you have a history you are you are a christian what is this about and he was like you know what um you're the only person so far who has uh talked about this so much in depth nobody is actually going into it uh maybe it's because it's because it's a complex topic and uh and both of the sides think okay maybe it's just you know this or maybe it's just that they just explain it away and they don't really discuss this issue maybe it's because uh christians and jews don't uh i don't know don't so don't study much or don't talk about the the name the tetragrammaton well, and <laughs> It, it's just i don't know it's a crazy thing to me it, when you it is wild no, <laughs> i think it's a s extremely strong devastating argument i i'm wondering too is it possible that because the at, the at the time that the quran is delivered or or recited or whatever when it first when, when it first happens and this revelation is sort of cobbled together in, in my view it seems to be a bunch of different sources that are kind of like stories that are that come from the Talmud, that come from uh, legends, that come from the Bible, that come from the Gospels, comes from um, Christian tradition, mm -hmm. uh, extra canonical books, as you mentioned, like the, the there's one called The Cave uh, of Treasures, there's one called uh, Life of Adam and Eve, there's there's Testament of Abraham, there's Proto Evangelium of James, there's all these different books that seem to have this influence on the collection we know of as, as the Quran and perhaps the Hadiths as well. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, like, maybe they didn't there was a linguistic barrier maybe with i mean the name yahweh would have been preserved in hebrew uh -huh. right even in probably uh the septuagint maybe 
And in the New Testament, right, as you said, Yahweh's there, but it's perhaps referenced indirectly with Yeshua, Jesus, right? Also, uh, hallelujah is mentioned in the exactly, New Testament. Exactly, good point, and, great point, yeah. So I'm just wondering, like, do you think maybe, and the reason this matters is, like, this would show total misunderstanding of the Old Testament, like the, the linguistic barrier. Like, would they just have not known this Hebrew name and then not understood the significance so then when they cobbled the the stories together for the Quran that's then one in, in other words it's another another attestation to lacking understanding of those texts because they didn't know what the language meant yeah um this is actually one of those points that um in me strengthens the belief that um that uh the way the Quran came into existence according to, to Islamic uh, tradition s seems to be accurate, um, e except from the part where uh, an angel actually inspires it, uh, <laughs> delivers it to Muhammad, um, that Muhammad did indeed recite these verses to people around him and that they did indeed write these things down. Maybe, uh, maybe along the lines, uh, during the compilation of these verses, things were lost and added and, and, and corrupted and all yeah. of that. But I feel like uh, it makes sense because of this that it was actually uh, Muhammad who did recite many of these things. And Muhammad was just some random guy who was dissatisfied with the religion in his environment, who looked up to the Jews and Christians and their beliefs, who tried to create uh, his own religion. Maybe he even believed that he is actually a prophet that right. he is actually being in, inspired, but he right. was just mentally ill, and uh, with the with the great lack of knowledge that he had, he simply um, took stories and took whatever he heard from the Jews and the Christians right. for yes. a fact. That's what, yeah. if, in fact, you can find many signs of that in the Quran. Um, you can find signs of uh, that it was uh, written by a human, where um, you repeatedly find in the Quran things like, and they say you are crazy, but uh, you are not. You are not crazy. You are not insane. You are not a liar. Like these these constant affirmations, uh, you know, which, which, which suggests that they might have been wondering. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. People yeah. were accusing him of being a liar, yeah. of believing uh, all their stories. Right. And the Quran even says that they called him the ear, which is. Uh, which is metaphorical, which is meant to mean that he just believes whatever people tell him. And it, at one point it even says, uh, and they say that uh, that you are simply taking these from some man and you and you are, you know, making up stories based on all the stories. But the person you are talking to or the person they are referring to speaks in a different tongue. So it can't be from him. What it's trying to say there is apparently uh, Muhammad was talking to this one guy who keeps telling him stories and Muhammad was then passing them on as revelations from Allah and people were accusing him of precisely doing that but the Quran then jumps in and says as an excuse that can't be true because that guy is actually uh, he speaks a different language his Arabic is not good but this this book is a, in a very good Arabic language but that's not really an argument because he could have yeah. just heard those stories and then you know <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> spoken them in his in his own Arabic yeah. language yeah and wow it just makes sense to me. You mentioned the story of the the seven sleepers, which um, is a, is a big story. Was a big story uh, at that time for the Christians. But the significance of it is also that uh, that story basically affirms the truth and the the salvation and the the peace found in in Christianity, mm -hmm. in in believing in the Trinity, in in the Father, the Son, and the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit. But Islam adopts this story and uh, presents the story as a sign from Allah that people right. who truly believe in him will find peace. But what it forgets in all of that is that this story, as it is known, took place in the Roman Empire where people right. believed in the Trinity. Yeah. If, if their religion was the truth, then this means that the Trinity was the truth. Right. And what are you, what are you going to do with that? Yeah. <laughs> no, that, that's what was so I, I didn't even know that until um, reading the Reynolds text that that this story makes us and is it in the is it it's the quran right that has yeah, this, yeah. this this, this yeah. story so it's not just hadith too, where you could say oh well that we don't call that it's weak no, no it's, it's actually in the quran, in the quran. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, right yeah in the quran in surah uh kaf which is yeah, off the cave that's where it, that's where it is there was another one too um one of the stories that reynolds mentions that i thought was pretty wild. oh the the sabbath is another another thing too that 
Reynolds mentions that the the Quran doesn't even understand the Saba. It thinks that it was this thing that the Jews made up. And then Allah was like, get rid of this. Not realizing that it's in the Ten Commandments, right? I mean, <laughs> I thought that was pretty wild. I, I mean, to me, I'm just kind of surprised reading through this book that it, there was just so many fundamental misunderstandings. That, you know, well, it, go ahead. What it does is, when it, what it says about the Sabbath is that um, that it was not prescribed yeah. on the Jews uh, un until they they um, they became... I don't know. They, they they transgressed, and it became an obligation upon them just because of their transgressions, oh. uh, which which they themselves basically caused. Right. Uh, and then okay. they were the sole group that was supposed to keep the Sabbath, but they would find uh, tricks around it, which is why Allah would constantly punish the Jews, and uh, including turning them into into monkeys, monkeys. yes, and, and things <laughs> like that. It's 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 very wild, and in one part it even makes a reference to uh, to God resting on the seventh day and it says um it says that that uh that that they claim that that, that god rests that allah rests but allah is uh above that like it does it doesn't it doesn't perceive the significance the meaning the you know the the the, the understanding of of what is being meant by resting and it basically rejects the whole idea that god rested which is why you cannot say that in islam but for some reason, but that's fundamental to the Sabbath, and yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, yeah, yeah. Wow. It's, it 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 is full of ignorance. It's like wherever you go, in any reference to the Old Testament or to the new or, or to the New Testament, for that matter, it's just full of ignorance. You can find so many holes. Another thing is the issue of Mary, which is also one that I um, that I dived in a lot. Which is um, it gets the name Mary wrong. And it refers to Mary, Miriam. mother yep. of Jesus, as uh, the sister of Aaron. And Moses, yeah. Which, which is which is the sister of Moses. <laughs> it yeah, doesn't right. make any sense. It thinks that there is only one Mary, and that is uh, sister of Aaron and mother of Jesus. Okay. Well, they'll say, uh, well, that's just because Jews could call all of their their brethren uh, by similar names, but. That would work for think words like brethren, right? Yeah. Like in other words, cousins could call themselves brethren, but you can't say that I'm Aaron <laughs> if I'm not from descended from Aaron, right? Yeah. It, uh, the funny thing is, it, it looks like if we accept their explanation that people just refer to uh, to Mary, mother of Jesus, as sister of Aaron because they were trying to make a connection to how, right. to her lineage or to yeah. how honorable she is, then it. it and Allah puts that in the Quran. That looks like Allah is trying really hard to give us doubts and to make us think that that, oh, that I see. Quran gets things wrong. It just does. It's 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 ridiculous because well, that, when I yeah. read that, I thought, "Wow, that that, that that looks like a huge mistake." Well, another another example that, that would demonstrate that it's not having some sort of spiritual significance of lineage or symbolic significance of lineage is the uh, Reynolds brings up the example of confusing. Haman and the story of Esther with uh, Pharaoh, and that oh, yeah. one doesn't make sense because they're not. There's not. There's no. I mean, you could say, well, there's a connection in that they persecute, but they're clearly totally different figures, and we don't get the impression that this is there in a symbolic way. We get the impression that it's actually just a confusion. Yeah, yeah. It is. It is. It is a confusion. It, it is just um, the Quran basically treats uh, Pharaoh as as a guy whose name is pharaoh that's what you that's the impression you get from from reading it and so it's not a title it's a guy named pharaoh. yeah because uh it, it doesn't use it as a title it basically yeah. uses it, uses it as a as a name without any article or anything attached to it interesting it just keeps referring to that guy as pharaoh and um uh, and Muslims nowadays think, oh, look, the Quran is being very accurate when it refers to that guy as Pharaoh, but to the other ruler, not as a Pharaoh. Uh, well, that's, that's probably because the Quran thought that that guy's name was Pharaoh. <laughs> His name is Pharaoh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bob Pharaoh. That's my name. Yeah. Call me Bob. <laughs> Bob Pharaoh. Bob Pharaoh. Well, uh, so I know we, we could always, we could keep going on and on. I don't want to keep you too long because uh, we're going to do another chat, I think very soon on your channel. So I'm happy to do that. I'm going to have links below the videos that we've referenced. Now you did a, you did kind of a debate, right? With, with Daniel. It wasn't really a debate. More of a discussion um, back and forth. 
yeah, what well, the first time that I talked to him was um, I invited him to explain what he um, how he wants to what he believes in terms of implementing the Sharia on all of us in saying that I should be killed and other, and other people should be executed and Islam should be enforced and he's all for that. That kind of that got out of hand a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about having a debate. He said, yeah, we could probably, but then he rejected and he never got back to it. And that one time that I talked with him about Yahweh, that is actually, um, that was a plot on my behalf where I thought, I love this topic. I'm pretty sure he knows nothing about it because his theological scriptural knowledge is pretty bad. So <clears throat> I caught him live somewhere where they were inviting people oh, to and you, challenge you, Islam. You and, I, <laughs> and, I, and I joined and just talked about this and he was totally, <laughs> I mean, it was a bit mean on my behalf, I guess. But <laughs> no, I thought it was a great objection. So yeah, um, yeah. really good argument. So yeah, I'll have those videos linked below. You guys can check that out in his channel. So sorry that the live stream didn't work tonight, guys. I want to remind you too that the show sponsor is shock.com. You want to up your toxic masculinity, you can do so by getting a hold of the Tonka Ali, uh, well, that's the She Legit, great for mental focus and clarity. Tonka Ali, 100% proven to boost testosterone. You can read the peer-reviewed studies over at chalk.com, the choq.com. Use the promo code J50, J-A-Y-5-0 to get 50% off all those products, Action 2.0, Irish Moss, She Legit, it's all there. Also, you can use the promo code J53LIFE, that's J53LIFE, to get 53% off any recurring subscriptions. Muslim, uh, excuse me, not Muslim. I was about to say Muslim skeptic. That's Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> Apostate prophet, excuse me, uh, my my buddy Ridvan. Thank you for coming on. Great conversation. Um, let's let's uh, have a chat again on your channel, whatever you want to cover. Um, thanks, thanks for coming on, man. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. We will be, I think, on my channel next week. We'll okay, cool. Up. Yeah, sounds great. Yeah.